to move up, evil lessens, right? There's a decrease of evil as we progress closer to um, perfection. Right, so you can imagine, uh, this is just conceptually, you know, you have like 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Once we reach the state of perfection, zero. There isn't any evil in that state of perfection. Okay? So I think that's, that's clear. As your inverse relationship, as we approach, as we get closer to evil, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> whole different story. As we get, um, Freudian you slip, as we get older, my brain, as we get closer to a state of perfection, then we recognize that there is a decrease in evil until we arrive at a state of perfection where there's no evil at all. It's been annulled, right? At its peak, it imagines the state in which all that is evil is annulled, and which only good creatures actually remain. Right? This is gonna this is just gonna inform my uh, eschatology series that I'm about to start uh, in a couple of days. But um, at its peak, it imagines the state in which all that is evil is annulled, and in which only good creatures actually remain. It does not even consider it settled that this antithesis of good and evil is conditional on the existence of both, right? What's not considered in this system is that the relationship of good, the sense in which I can make sense of that which is good, is tied to a notion of that which is evil. So that this structure, as one structure, is comprised of the part of it that's good and the part of it that's, that's evil. If I were to destroy evil, I would transform the nature of the structure. I would destroy what it is that goodness is, right? So the, this, this is a sort of really bootleg example, but just so that you have it in your head. It does not, the system, this ideological system, does not even consider, um, it's settled that the antithesis of good and evil is conditional on the existence of both. It is, by definition, then, antithetical, combative, um, ideologically opposed, conceptually opposed, polemical, right? It is that antithetical relationship between good and evil that actually serves as the condition for good and evil. That's not even contemplated. Obviously, it's not an easy thing to get your mind around, right? But what Nietzsche is saying, and obviously this is what Nietzsche believes, this is what I believe, that the antithetical relationship between good and evil is precisely the condition for the possibility of good and evil, right? To then disassociate good from evil or evil from good is to collapse the antithesis, is to collapse the polemic, and thus to collapse the notion of good and evil. That's, 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 conceptually, that's conceptually rigorous. Um, on the contrary, the latter should vanish and the former remain. Evil should disappear and only the good should end. And in the end, all that was was the good. One has a right to exist. The other ought not to be there at all. And that's note 351, right? So that the idea, um, as manifest within this world, unfolds like this. You have two states of affairs and two individuals and two ideological systems, right? Belief one, belief two. person from the system of beliefs, beliefs ones, assumes that they are, their desire, their values are directed towards personal immortality. Belief two, individual from beliefs two is, we'll just say an egoist, in a, whatever sense you want to. And basically, sort of the idea of egoism, it's, it's antithetical to personal immortality, right? It embraces mortality. Um, you have as many years in existence as nature allows you, affords you, whether you die of natural causes or someone takes you out of existence, that's all the time that you have. Therefore, the time that I have in this world needs to be maximized to its fullest because once I'm dead, it's all over, right? That idea. So, sort of a person who is driven by personal immor immortality and a person who's driven by egoism. We're going to get more into the idea of egoism, if not in this section, in the, in the next section. Nietzsche's going to start to talk about that, that discourse on, on egoism. So, what ends up happening then is we meet on the street. 
And for whatever reasons, not because of any tension, not because of any inherent hostility, you recognize that the egoist, right, the egoist is going to see all of the values that are attributed to the system of belief. Right? So this would be values. Right? All of the values attributed to the system of belief are informed by the person motivated for immortality, by the desire for that immortality. And the rules, quote-unquote, for the game is that the person has to live in such a way that he or she presents no threat to the other. Right, so I, I sort of live this no threat lifestyle. Right? I live this sort of no threat lifestyle. And immediately in association, in, in discussion, in conversation with this individual, I, I start to recognize, wait, well, this, this person doesn't really present much of a threat right, at all. Um, this, this person is, is, this person is motivated by another, another, another principle than I have, right? I start to recognize that the system of beliefs that's governing my actions couldn't be governing the other person's actions. I don't even need to ask you what your system of beliefs are, right? Because if, again, we shared the same system of beliefs, I would be able to identify or at least assume that you and I had similar interests as an egoist because I would expect you to perform in a similar way that I perform. I notice, however, that you present no threat. You're, you're, you're very conducive to whatever it is that I suggest. You're very receptive. And granted, this is, you know, this is, this is, we're at a point in the discussion where, you know, very sort of trite thinking can throw you off course, right? It's not to say that a person motivated by personal immortality, someone breaks in your house and they're not going to use defense to protect your family. We're, I mean, that's, we're sort of way past that, right? The idea is, however, on a very, very latent substrate of human cognition, we're talking that level, I recognize that your system of belief makes you weak. You think it makes you strong, but I don't believe in what you believe in. I don't believe in a world of transcendence. I only believe in this world, and I recognize then immediately that I have the power to manipulate you. Right? I have the power to manipulate you because you aren't going to present a threat to me. Right? And this manifests in many different ways. One of the clearest manifest, manifestations of this recognition that the other, e, the other, it's not an egoist, the other individual is no threat is manifested in Note 12b, right? This is what he discusses in Note 12b. Right? Because you don't present a threat, I'm gonna, you, you're going to be handled. I will control the way in which, I don't have to put my hands on you, I'm going to put my mind on you, right? Um... I'm going to control the way that you exist in this world. And you won't even know that I'm controlling the way that you exist in this world. It's a very powerful concept, right? It's, 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 it's a very powerful concept. It's a very powerful concept. It's even more interesting when two egoists meet. I'm not going to get into that now, right? When two egoists meet and another egoist recognizes that, wow, this guy has a level of control that's out of this world and we're going to allow him in this very bizarre sense, to control, just to an extent, our behavior. And he'll know that he's controlled a bit, right? We'll let him know that. Or we'll let her know that. Because the insight that they have, I mean, I can't even, I can't describe this. I can't describe this type of stuff. There has to come a point at which you get so immersed in the in the text itself. I had, a, I had someone ask me, quick side note, I had someone ask me on uh, Facebook a couple days ago, um, what do I think a good student is? And I was like, eh, you know, I don't really care about good students. Uh, I, I, I care about the exceptional students. And I don't mean grades-wise, right? I mean, uh, Einstein probably couldn't pass uh, a contemporary physics exam. Um, he was undeniably a genius, though, right? He, he, his, mind, his mind was structured in a different way. And in order to gain access to that structure, he needed to really immerse himself in what it is that he was fascinated by, which was physics. With respect to philosophical thinking... I can only speak on that point, the, this point, because I've immersed myself in this discipline at, at manic levels, consistently, daily, for about a decade now. There comes a point at which you recognize that you don't even really need to be as elaborate as structuring an entire system of belief and publishing it and putting it out there. And this is how you control other people. Right? You can be so good at what it is that you do that the mere suggestion 